Yeah, sure that was, yeah, yeah. I did like to start by thanking Dr. Shamar and Dr. Raja and to Cameron and me, who is our president of the South African Children and Arms Society. And we've got two past presidents, so you really having a privilege meeting this afternoon. Three presidents or past presidents from the South African Children and Arms Society with close to 100 years of child experience. So, and we're seriously privileged. And we're going to start with Sham. He's going to talk about tenant uh, transfers, which have become much more popular in the, probably the last decade um, and expanded from the only the legitimacy for both to superior cut test to, to other things. And then Leon's going to discuss uh, sort of the dilemmas with um, what surgery to do with people. We have a rotating cup tear and a dislocation. You don't see them that commonly, but they are usually a dilemma for us what to do because they get stuck. Maybe um, Leon can give us some answers. And then finally, Cameron's going to give us the update on uh, first time and recurrent dislocators, what the consensus um, studies that have been recently published. He's going to run through them and just hopefully not give you too much information, more information than you've been taught here already. But um, if he gives us some rubbish, we'll challenge him and see what happens. And then finally, I'm going to talk about um, sepsis in the shoulder, and most specifically the reverse shoulder, which we sing a lot more of, because nearly 70 to 80 percent of shoulder patients are now reverse shoulder placement. So we're seeing a, we're seeing these patients come through now, and it's not quite the same as hip and knee, but I'll discuss that. So we're going to start off with Sham from um, Durban. Who is going to talk about the tenant transfers and returning up? Thanks very much, Shannon. Yeah, no, thank you for inviting me on this talk, uh, Steve, or your, your, your registrar conference. Uh, firstly, can you see my screen? Is that coming up? Yeah, we can. Okay. All right. Can you and hear you. me? Okay. So I can start then, shall I? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, I'm just focusing on tenant transfers for advanced rotator cuff. And this advanced means irreparable rotator cuff tears. So <clears throat> we know that massive cuff tears uh, leads to fatty infiltration, muscle wasting, uh, tendon degeneration, and retraction. And these are all pro poor prognostic factors for tendon healing. Uh, Collins has classified these into anterior uh, superior cuff tears, posterior superior cuff tears, uh, as well as uh, global tears involving the whole rotator cuff. So these... Massive tears will eventually become irreparable with time. This then leads to cuff tear arthropathy, where there is uh, absence of abnormalities in the biomechanics of the shoulder. And therefore, you see uprighting of the humeral head as well as medialization and ultimately leading to arthritis. So the indications for doing tendon transfers, obviously in the young patient, they require pain relief, they require mm -hmm. range of motion, they require strength. And in these, we try to do balancing of the force couples in the shoulder, which therefore may delay degenerative changes in the shoulder. And we also know that the long-term outcomes of reverse shoulder replacements in young patients and who are active is unknown. And therefore, this may not be the primary solution to patients, uh, young patients. Uh, rather than doing a reverse, we would look at other options. So this is just a, a basic background. We know that the shoulder has basically a horizontal and vertical force couples. The vertical force couples is made by the uh, deltoid and supraspinatus. And the supraspinatus creates an inferior directed force and therefore senses the humeral head okay. while the deltoid is active. This is the vertical force couple. The horizontal force couples are made up of the anterior and posterior cuff, which is the subscap anteriorly, and the teres minor and infraspinatus posteriorly. And these also center the humeral head. So any defect of these will lead to abnormality in the opposite direction. And this may lead to either unidirectional or bidirectional weakness. But this is all quite confusing because now do you classify these according to what tear you have or do you classify it by what the loss of function is? And with tenant transfers, we're looking at the loss of function. And these are classic clinical tests that you would do, the Job's drop-on test, for supraspinatus weakness, the Hornblower test, this is for infraspinatus and posterior cuff weakness, 
the external rotation legs and specifically for infraspinatus uh, and uh, the lift-off test, as you know, is for subscapularis weakness. So these are more important to assess when you see these patients rather than looking at all these MRIs and X-rays and trying to work it out. So th these are tells you what the clinical functional or the functional deficit in the patient is. So these tests are very important to do to understand the deficit in these patients. The clinical presentation of these massive cuff tears, they may present in various ways. So you can get painful loss of forward elevation, and these are described by uh, Pascal Below in his studies. Painful loss of forward elevation means a supraspinatus tear. And these patients have pain mainly on overhead activities because as they forward flex, the humeral head tends to uh, migrate superiorly. And these patients present with a positive Jobs drop arm test. In these patients who have just pure supraspinatus tears, they have intact horizontal force couples, but they have lost the vertical force couple. And for these patients, we would consider a lat dorsi transfer. While lat dorsi, if you look at the uh, image at the bottom on the right, lat dorsi has a much more vertical orientation to the top of the shoulder. And therefore, if you transfer lat dorsi superiorly, you'd create an inferiorly directed force to the shoulder. So this is looking at biomechanics and direction of pull. What about isolated loss of total active elevation deficit. And these patients have true pseudoparalysis. What is pseudoparalysis? You know, there's many, many definitions, but pseudoparalysis means if you can't fold flex more than 45 degrees, then you're more likely dealing with a pseudoparalysis. And this 45 degrees means this is thoracic, uh, scapular thoracic motion that you're seeing. You're not seeing motion in the shoulder. So in these patients they have loss of active elevation, uh, they basically have loss of both the vertical and horizontal force couples. And for these, you cannot restore a function if you have bidirectional instability with a tendon transfer. So these patients would therefore be more indicated for reverse shoulder replacements. What about isolated loss of external rotation? These patients have loss of external rotation, but they have some sort of forward flexion. In these patients, you'd have a positive external rotation in the leg sign with the arm at the side. But with the arm at 90 degrees of abduction, you'd have a positive horn blower sign. With the arm at the side, with lat weakness mainly in this direction, we now would look at either lat dorsi or combined with the teres, uh, teres major transfer, which is called the lepiscopo, or we would look at a lower trapezius transfer. But if you have loss of external rotation at 90 degrees and weakness in that position, now, those patients are better off treated with a lat dorsi transfer. And I'll come back to all of these as we go along. If you have isolated loss of external rotation, again, uh, if you have a very strong posterior deltoid, this may, uh, uh, comp uh, um, this may help with external rotation in 90 degrees. And these patients, therefore, need to look at loss of external rotation mainly at the side. So for these patients, we would use combined either, uh, sorry, these are combined infraspinatus and teres minor tears. If the posterior deltoid is strong, this, as I said, maintains the external rotation and abduction. Therefore, these patients require strengthening of external rotation at the side. And for these, we'd either consider a lepiscopo, which is a lat dorsi and teres major, or a lower trapezius transfer. Why is external rotation important? This plays an external, important functional deficit if you don't have external rotation in the patient. They cannot comb the hair, they cannot reach the side of the face, they cannot open doors, they have trouble uh, using their phones. So it's, it's, it results in significant disability for these patients. And therefore, these patients require some strength recovery. What if you have combined loss of external rotation as well as elevation? This means that you've got a combination of a, su a supraspinatus as well as supra infraspinatus and teres minor tear, which is a posterior superior cuff tear. In these patients, they've lost both the vertical as well as the horizontal force couples. And once again, you cannot just do a tendon transfer. You have to combine this with a reversal replacement and possible tendon transfer to restore external rotation. John Carney then also described the problem anteriorly, where you have anterior superior tears, uh, sorry, uh, anterior rotator cuff tears, and these are basically subscapularis tears. Uh, 
If you know, if you have a subscapularis tear, you have a positive Berry press test, a positive Behat test, and positive Lufthoff test. This is your unidirectional loss. And for this, an anterior transfer of a tendon, such as a pec major or lat dorsi transfer will be indicated. But if you have a combined loss of elevation and internal rotation, this is a bidirectional instability where you have combined supraspinatus as well as subscap tears. For this, a lat dorsi or anterior transfer does not work. You have to combine this with a reverse shoulder replacement. So what are the principles of tendon transfers? We know that the donor site or the donor must be expendable. It must have a similar excursion uh, and must have a similar line of pull to the tendon that you want to replace. They must have good strength because you're going to lose one grade of strength after transfer. And as you said, one muscle for one function. If you have two muscles involved, maybe a tendon transfer alone may not suffice. So let's look at lat dorsi transfer. This was originally described for birth palsies and herb palsies, but Gerber then you demonstrated a lat dorsi transfer for, for posterior superior cuff tears using a two incision technique. So he harvested the posterior uh, uh, lattice dorsi, then he made a lateral incision with a lateral acromial osteotomy to reach the uh, rotator cuff footprint. And he did show good results. They were improving in pain, although there were marginal grains in strength recovery, more so in females than males. But the contraindication is that if you have a, a combined subscap tear as well as a posterior superior tear, uh, you cannot do a lat dorsi transfer because now you direct the force posteriorly and the shoulder will now want to sublux anteriorly. We know that the lat dorsi is a big muscle that arises off the spinal scapula and, uh, and inserts into the base of the uh, tip of the scapula, as well as inserting anteriorly. It serves as an adductor and an internal rotator of the arm. Uh, it has good excursion, and the, the humeral insertion is usually tenderness in nature. So how do you do this? How do you do a lat dorsi transfer? And normally patient, place the patient in a lateral decubitus position. The incision is based over the anterior deltoid, I mean, anterior border of the lat dorsi. And the lat dorsi is the most anterior structures in the back of the shoulder. So that's where you base your incision. You separate this from teres major, but must protect the neurovascular bundle. And you may want to release the attachment of the lat dorsi to the scapula. The problem is anteriorly. The anterior release is important. What lies in front of the lat dorsi is the radial nerve, which is at risk. Also the auxiliary nerve, which lies inferiorly. So with the arm in internal rotation, you have to be careful, you have to identify where the auxiliary nerve is, protect, if you can, the radial nerve by usually using a finger dissection, and then the tendon is released off the humerus. At this point in time, you can either tube the lat dorsi, or you can leave it as a flat structure, and you can add a graft or a, a device to it. Once that is done, you can either use a two incision, as Gerber described, by using a lateral approach or a lateral acromial uh, chromium, uh, uh, osteotomy. But Habermeyer has described one incision technique where he uses the posterior, uh, posterior part of the incision, transfers the lat dorsi to the infraspinatus footprint insertion. Obviously, you can access it from the one incision by doing it this way. And actually, the, the point of insertion to the infraspinatus footprint is what uh, determines the functional outcome from lat dorsi. If you extend the lat dorsi superior onto the uh, rotator footprint, this acts almost like a interposition graft, but the main function is at the lat dorsi insertion, at, at the infraspinatus insertion. One of the problems is that if you do try to pull this over to the great tuberosity, you might compromise the neurovascular pedicle, which then leads to atrophy. And that's why I don't really aim to put this over the top, but I try to attach it more to the infraspinatus footprint and any residual tendon, I would use it as an interposition over the tuberosity. Uh, the arthroscopic assisted technique uh, is done uh, in a, uh, a cat push and can you describe the full arthroscopic technique and this prevented the delta attachment. But the arthroscopic assisted means an open harvest of the, uh, sorry, beg your pardon. The arthroscopic assisted means uh, open harvest and then using your, uh, your scope to bring in the tendon anteriorly into the sub, uh, subacromial bursa, 
and fix this whichever, whichever way you can. In this case, you can see we've actually marked the tendon with a metal marker. So on post up x rays, we can see if the tendon is still attached. So, what are the results from a lead dossier transfer? There were 10 studies looked at the uh, multi study, uh, uh, multiple studies. Follow up was for about 45 months, which is quite long. And there were definitely improvement in constant scores from 49, 45 to an average of 73 post op. Forward elevation was also shown to be improved. Extra vector rotation also improved. But if you do the lead dossier where you had a subscap tear, if advanced tear is minor atrophy, these definitely led to poorer outcomes. So the contraindications to lead dossier transfer is if you have a bi-directional weakness where you have loss of both vertical and horizontal force couples. If you have an absent subscap or an atrophic tear is minor, this would not probably give you a good outcome. Of course, if you have advanced atrophy, Hamada grade three and above, uh, tendon transfer would probably not be indicated. You also need compliance from the patient for the post-op immobilization and muscle re-education because you're converting a lat dossier, which is an internal rotator, to an external rotator. So this requires significant uh, rehab and muscle re-education, and you have to find the patient who's willing to go through uh, both the post-op immobilization and rehabilitation. Of course, if you have deltoid weakness and nerve palsies, these would be a contraindication to doing a lat dossier transfer alone. What about uh, a lower trapezius transfer? Uh, Basti Malasen in 2007 described his technique for doing a, a lower trapezius transfer. What he demonstrated was the lower trapezius it has the same line of pull as the infraspinatus. It has a synergistic contraction and it acts as a scapular retractor like infraspinatus does. So in these anatomical studies, it was clearly shown and what he did was he harvested uh, the tendon of the medial border of the scapula, which is a very small triangular insertion, which is based inferior to the scapula. Be careful that you don't go two centimeters beyond the medial border because that could lead to uh, damage to the accessory nerve. The tendon lies superficially, so therefore when you open this, the tendon lies very superficially, so don't dig too deep. And once this is mobilized, we know that the tendon is quite short. It's not going to reach the shoulder. So you need to do an elongation of this. The initial description was using an Achilles tendon allograft. And this was performed with two incisions and required a deltoid takedown. Oscopic techniques have since been described both by Bernard uh, Basim Alassane and other authors. Uh, we do a open uh, uh, lower trapezius harvest. We then fix the graft to the uh, upper part of the uh, 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 rotator footprint. We then pass the graft between infraspinatus and deltoid posteriorly, and then this is then attached to the lower trapezius, and this is done with the arm in abduction and full external rotation. The very techniques, Pulvertuft weave is described, but you can actually just suture it on its own. Yeah. And we know that the outcomes from these transfers by yeah. Bernard uh, Basim al Hassan has shown that he had significant improvements of uh, the visual analog scales and functional scores. The average recovery of full flexion was 220 degrees, mm -hmm. abduction 80 degrees, and external rotation 50 degrees. So these are good functional outcomes. And good functional outcomes were seen in patients who had greater than 60 degrees of forward elevation pre op. If you have less than 60 degrees of forward elevation, you may want to consider a lap dossier transfer. We in this country, of course, have uh, Achilles and tendon allografts, but allografts are subject to the availability, the quality of the grafts, whether the patient has any allergy or infection, rates are higher with these. So Valenti used a 10 centimeter double hamstring autograft. He, used, he looked at 14 patients with up to 24 months of follow-up, and he shows significant improvement in constant scores, vast scores, and uh, simple shoulder tests. We also show that his patients sub, uh, showed negative horn blower and negative external rotation lag signs by his technique. And this may be a suitable technique in our environment where you're worried about allografts. Post-op management of these 
the transfers and uh, the post superior cuffs, the arm is immobilized in abduction and neutral rotation for up to six weeks. In fact, Valenti suggests using a spiker cast immobilization, which obviously is not all well tolerated in a lot of patients. He then uses a graduated strengthening program. And the, <clears throat> as I said, if you, that Dorsey, you need muscle re-education, but if you're using the lower trapezius, this is not so much a problem. What about isolated loss of internal rotation? In this, we know you have a complete subscapular rupture with positive clinical signs, but elevation, fold flexion maintained. So if you have this situation where you have an intact vertical force couple, but a lack of internal rotation, which is a lack of horizontal force couple, your two options, well, actually there should be three. Uh, one is considering a pec major or a lateral transfer for these patients. So if you have a combined horizontal and vertical force couples, once again, you cannot use a tendon transfer alone where you have both the subscap and supraspinatus tear. These patients usually have pseudoparalysis, bidirectional weakness, and for this, you would consider a reverse TSR and maybe a lat dorsi to restore internal rotation. What about pec major transfer? This is described way back in 1907 by uh, Wirth uh, and also by Hirsch in 2000. Basically, we would use the clavicular or the sternocostal head of the pec major. Uh, you can either put this under the uh, conjoint tendon or anterior to it. If you put it behind the conjoint tendon, you have better direction of pull uh, where compared to one lying anterior to the conjoint tendon. The, in this case, you can see a pec uh, synocostal head has been used and passed underneath the conjoint tendon, uh, sorry, under the coracobraculus and inserted into the, uh, into the anterior part of the shoulder. We know that pec major transfers in studies, uh, in recent systematic reviews, the pain constant scores improve from 37 to 61 uh, and improves significantly after doing a subcoracoid or a subconjoint tendon routing. The strength recovery, however, was poor and deteriorates with time. And one of the problems is you're putting this big muscle in front of the shoulder. If you have to do revision shoulder surgery, this becomes extremely difficult to do. And therefore, if you do something like this, you have to be aware of what might happen down the line if you have to reconvert uh, this to some other procedure. So, so Bassem once again used, looked at the feasibility of using lat dorsi uh, and Terry's major to reconstruct uh, subscap tears. And in this case, if you look at the line of pull of the uh, lat dorsi, this has a similar origin uh, from the, uh, the deep scapula. And, it, and runs in pretty much the same direction. If you look at pec major, pec major lies anterior to the chest and therefore the line of pull is not right. And therefore it may not be the solution for patients who have significant subscap weakness. So Basim showed that this is, arises from the posterior chest wall has the same vector subscap and is a synergistic internal rotator like the subscap is. So he basically, Harvested this lattice supers dorsally anteriorly. You may do this as, a, as one or two incision uh, because sometimes you want to mobilize the lat dorsi further in the axilla. Uh, you can do uh, dissection anteriorly, but you have to be careful of neurovascular structures around you. And if you mobilize it, you can actually bring the subscap, uh, sorry, the lat dorsi to the upper subscap if you have an upper third subscap tear. If you have an upper third subcap tear, you may consider using a pec minor transfer where the pec minor is harvested, taken off with the, a, a little osteotomy of the medial coracoid, and this is then transferred subcoracoid to the anterior upper part of the subscap. This is, can be done all arthroscopic, uh, but usually we are seeing big tears of the subscap and therefore pec minor for a full thickness subscap tear is not adequate. The transfer, as I said, of lat dorsi for subcap chairs can be done either open, arthroscopic assisted, or all arthroscopic. Uh, I prefer an auxiliary incision sometimes to mobilize the lat dorsi, but I cannot get the lat dorsi to come up anteriorly. And the transfer is done, then done arthroscopically. Uh, 
So if you do this for subscap chairs, with systematic review showed that both of these lat dossier as well as pick major transfers showed improvement in uh, functional scores as well as in pain relief and some improvement in range of motion and strength recovery. They showed no progression of osteoarthritis in these patients, but the strength recovery was better with lat dossier compared to pick major. Both transfers improve pain, but the short-term results favor lat dossier and long-term trouble with doing a PEC major transfer may want you to consider a lap dossier rather than a PEC major. So in summary, tendon transfers can improve pain and function in young active patients and sometimes in elderly patients who have isolated weakness in one direction. And you can delay the need for joint replacement. And as newer, recent newer techniques and newer tendon transfers show encouraging delay in degenerative changes. The decision-making should be done on the loss of force couples. So one muscle loss equals one function. Therefore, bidirectional loss is the contraindication to do a single tendon transfer. So once again, in summary, if you have painful loss of active elevation where supraspinatus is the main problem, leading to pain, where you have intact horizontal force couples, for this, I consider a lap dossy transfer. If you have isolated total loss of active elevation, where you have a true pseudoparalysis, where you have loss of both vertical and horizontal fast force couples, in that case, you do a reverse total shoulder replacement. In this case, you might combine that. Uh, if you have weakness at the side, you may do a lower trapezius transfer, but if the weakness is 90 degrees abduction, uh, sorry, this is, uh, sorry, I, I missed a step here. Uh, if you have isolated elevation with external rotation weakness, we normally combine a reverse wood uh, 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 lat dorsi transfer. If you have isolated loss of external rotation alone, where the, where the pain is loss is mainly at the side, we would consider a lower trapezius transfer. If you have weakness at 90 degrees of abduction, we would probably consider a lat dorsi transfer. But if you have active forward flexion beyond 60 degrees, I would then consider a lower trapezius transfer. If you have isolated loss of external rotation, uh, where you have combined posterior infraspinous and teres minor transfer, if the posterior deltoid is strong, uh, where you have mainly weakness in the arm at the side, I would do a lower trapezius transfer. If you have combined loss of elevation and external rotation, where you have supraspinous, uh, sorry, posterior superior cuff tear, you will need to combine that with the reverse as well as the lat dorsi transfer. If you have isolated loss of internal rotation with a complete subscap tear, for that, you may, may consider a pec major or a lat dorsi transfer. And if you have combined complete loss of elevation and internal rotation, you would consider a reverse shoulder, shoulder replacement with or without a lat dorsi transfer. So I hope that gives you some sort of insight in how to approach the tenor transfers. And I think that's the end of my talk. Thanks very much, Shane. It's, uh, it's um, very, very nicely done because it gives us a clear uh, thought process on, on how to make the, the decisions. I think there's some dispute which I'll come to, to now and then ask yeah. some yeah. questions. Uh, any oh. comments or questions from the <laughs> Yeah. The first, let me, let me start first by Jan. Um, Sham, I know I'm not being facetious, but I mean, it's a difficult decision and it was discussed at our meeting. And one comment was the older patient is somebody who's 10 years older than you. So, it, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, when, when do you consider that you need to do it, uh, a reverse or another procedure rather than a tendon transfer? Do you have an age cutoff? Do you have a physical activity <laughs> cutoff? I think you saw from what I talk about. We, we're not talking about age only. We talk about functional loss. So if you have if you have a patient who's got weakness of external rotation, but they have no osteoarthritis, they have an intact subscap. Uh, even if the patient's elderly, I would consider a tendon transfer for those patients. So it's not indicated just in the poor in the young patient. Obviously, in the young patient, our concern is if you've got combined loss, you have problems because you have vertical and horizontal loss of a force couple loss. Are you going to do a reverse in those patients? We don't know what the outcomes are in the long term. So there's no doubt that you would consider a reverse in patients who have advanced osteo, uh, advanced cuff arthropathy 
combined, combined vertical and horizontal loss uh, forces. And those are basically the ones I would definitely indicate for. But if you have a, a global tear where you have tears in the front as well as the back of the shoulder, tendon transfer those may not work, although Basim has talked about transferring lat dorsi to the front and lower trapezius to the back. But, you know, that's, that's still kind of experimental. We haven't got the full results. That's his, he calls it a parachute technique. But if you have bidirectional loss uh, with cuff arthropathy, then that patient needs a reverse. But otherwise, if you don't have this, that situation where you have no OA, unidirectional loss, then the tendon transfer will give you a better outcome in younger patients. And we don't have to face the long-term problems with doing a reverse in such a young patient. Cool. Um, Shannon, the decision making about reverse total shoulder requiring a, a tendon transfer, um, you, you put it quite clearly in your indications and when you use it, but I think there's more subtlety to it in that if you're putting a reverse shoulder and you still have an intact teres minor by lateralizing, um, you actually improving your external rotation. There's some studies that have shown that you don't, there was no difference in adding a latissimus dorsi or not adding a latissimus dorsi in patients with loss of external rotation. However, we, I've seen a few patients, and we've just shown them in the meetings, is that if you have a reverse and you can't external rotation, they still have big problems getting in, um, with that loss of external rotation. So the patient, if you see, has complete loss of, of the external rotators, usually they have fracture patients with tuberosities, resorption of bone, or revisions. Those patients, I would definitely do a tendon, a tendon transfer. But sometimes that dorsi is missing because the bone loss at the, at the front. Um, I haven't seen any papers using a lower trap for external rotation in that group. And it concerns me because if you look at the reverse shoulder, a lot of movement is based on scapular thoracic function rather than genigumal. So you're now taking away one of your scapular functioning muscles. So it's a concern doing a low trap. In fact, we have one of our students who's looking at, at whether to do a let or a latissimus dorsi or a lower trap uh, on a computer modeling and in a Kodava study. So what is your thoughts now on always doing a tendon transfer for a, when you're doing a reverse? I, I think it's, yeah, it's, you know, with the newer, obviously our original reverse was a Gramon type, inferiorizing, and those patients would not recover external rotation strength. But now with lateralizing your implants by using a lateralized genosphere, a 135 degree prosthesis, you now obviously lateralize more than inferiorize. And therefore, as you said, it might tension the remaining structures or the remaining rotator cuff. And therefore you might not need a tendon transfer. Uh, I, I kind of, if I have got a positive horn blower sign in the patient, I am more inclined to still do a tendon transfer at the same time. My feeling is I'm there. I'll just do the transfer. But is, as you said, it's is, is now becoming questioned as to whether you need to do these transfers. I must say, I don't do a lat dorsi transfer for internal rotation loss, you know, I'm doing a reverse. But for the, for the external rotation loss, I, I'm kind of inclined to still do a lat dorsi if I have a positive handle sign, although I do use lateralized implants now. Yeah. <clears throat> any, any comments? Yeah, I have a question. So, with the poor results in chronic repairs, chronic tear repairs, um, would you ever consider doing a, a transfer onto a repair as an augmentation to get the repair? Sure, so the question was if, if, you, if you've got a massive, what it looks like, one well, of the repairable tear is one of those with chronic. Uh, changes atrophy and and if you do repair, would you ever augment it with a tendon transfer, or have you ever augmented? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously that kind of makes logical sense that you could do that. But you know, um, what are the bad prognostic factors for healing? I mean, you know, we know you've got more than stage three fat infiltration, more than stage contraction. You have significant muscle atrophy. Those are all poor prognostic factors for healing. You know, once again, it depends on what age of the patient you're dealing with. So if you have those poor prognostic factors in a 70-year-old, I would probably just do a reverse straight off of the patient. But once again, we come back to these young, active, uh, manual kind of workers who you're not going to do a reverse. 
Um, I must say, I would in those patients, I would consider repair and basically augmentation right, with biceps uh, or bring in medialization of the footprint. I would do all kinds of techniques, uh, mobilization of the cuff to try and repair the cuff. But I wouldn't, I haven't done a tendon transfer ab initio for these things. I still use the KISS principle, which is keep it simple, right? So I'll try the repair first. If that fails, then I'll consider my option for whether I'm going to do a tendon transfer, SCR, or any other pro any other procedure for that. I, I, I know that I've got two patients that we plan to do tendon transfers, and at the time of surgery, we found that we could repair the cuff. And both of them had previous cuff repairs, and so I repaired the rotator cuff at the same time as doing the tendon transfer. And but I know I followed up both those patients, and that cuff I repaired, which is usually anterior to the tendon transfer. They both had the, those tendon. The tendon repair failed, but the, the intact trunk was compared. You can see it very nicely with the lower trunk. Much harder with the distance to see it on the um, But the lower trunk you can see on the side. Very I, what, once again, what is what is your expected outcome from cuff repairs? You know, we know some cuff repairs that you heal to look well on investigation, but the patient's functional scores, mm -hmm. the patient's uh, constant scores are down. And yet, sometimes you have a cuff that's not intact, but the patient has good function. So, you know, sometimes you might be jumping the gun by doing these things. Maybe you should try and repair them, rehab them, and then reassess them. And that's my approach to younger patients. I'd like to put a question out there because the lower trap has now become very popular. Um, our, our experience with it is that you've had one or two failures, and I, I have a horrible feeling that the Achilles tendon is not the same as the Achilles tendon they use in the stage, which is a fresh frozen. Compared to ours is uh, radiated, even stamped on, thrown around, and three months later we get this dead, really dead tissue, which is, I think maybe we should be harvesting a hamstring, but now on a 60 year old, you're having, uh, harvesting a hamstring as well as a tendon transfer. So I just, if anybody's got an experience, maybe could get their feet. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, Steve, I mean, I have, uh, I have the same experience with Achilles tendon allografts. You know, they, they don't, not as good. They don't have significant strength. Uh, they tend to sort of degenerate. So getting it from our bone bank is probably not the ideal thing. So I'm moving more towards hamstring transfers. I actually tell the patient I'm going to take the hamstrings. And I've had much better outcomes using their own hamstrings than using allografts. I have some good results with allografts. But it's a bit un more, un more unpredictable for me. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that my, my, uh, with, with respect to allogra uh, allografts, no, I have no experience. I, I don't really have any confidence with the allografts that we have in South Africa. I think with, uh, with using the um, attendant transfer with a rotator cuff repair, uh, I, I consider using a, a tendon transfer when they're not able to maintain external rotation at the side. I think if they're able to maintain their arm neutral at the side, then natural, lateralization at 135 is probably a reasonable option when, if the deltoid is, if, you're, if you have confidence in the deltoid. So I think that's the, the, that's the one way I do it, which is a nice way of doing fewer tendon transfers with your reverse replacements. So you can argue as to why you, why you say that, but the literature does support that type of approach. Any comments? I, I'll make one last comment. There's definitely a tenodesis effect there. Some of this is not active external rotation. If you look, the external rotation better on cord elevation, which is on a tenodesis effect. There's no doubt in my mind. It, uh, a we saw it in the children as well, but that don't affect it. Nothing? And sadly, the meta-analysis for these massive potato cuff tears don't so much different between a reverse shoulder replacement, a tendon transfer, a partial rotator cuff repair, and uh, what was the other thing? And uh, superior capillary reconstruction. So you've got some other options. But when you, this, this is, the tendon transfer is, as Sham said, it's a functional loss that you're operating. It's not the, it's not the pain. So it's a pain and a functional loss. And it's a different to a massive cuff tear function. So if you can keep that in mind. Shana has a brilliant talk. Thank you very much. It's quite clear um, on when we use and what we use. Thanks, man. So now we're going to go to Leon.
Mm. Slightly, pro probably also reasonably uncommon problem that we face, but um, is the rotating cut tear and dislocation. And it's usually in the older group of patients, but I've just seen surprisingly two young patients in the last three months who've had rotating cut tears as well as a dislocation. So it's unusual in the younger patients, but more common. Problem. Thanks, Leon. Thanks again, Michelle. Hey, welcome, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Can we share this? Can you share your screen? Oh, brilliant. We can see it. We can see it, Leon. And let's check you on YouTube. Am I? Can, can you hear? And can you hear? Can you hear, Steve? And can you see the screen? We can hear perfectly, and we can see that you're about to go on to um, full PowerPoint. Okay. Good. Um, that's perfect, yeah? Yeah. Okay, uh, from, from me, thank you as well for inviting me to be part of this update. I'm going to look at a slightly less common problem, which is a rotator cuff tears in anterior shoulder instability. Uh, as a reminder, the rotator cuff plays an important part in shoulder instability. It is a dynamic stabilizer. Um, if uh, Try to remember that it creates concavity compression in the middle arc of movement when the capsule and labrum is lax. At the end range of movement, the rotator cuff limits motion and decreases strain on the glenohumeral ligaments. In cadaver studies, uh, with 50% decrease in rotator cuff muscle activity, you have a 50% increased chance of dislocation, and dislocation requires a smaller Bankart lesion. So the first, the first thing about Rotator cuff tears and shoulder instabilities, as, as, as Steve referred to, is age. Now, in this study from the Mayo Clinic, uh, looking at the natural history of first time anterior dislocation in patients older than 50 years, they found rotator cuff tears present in 92% of patients over the age of 50 years with a first time anterior dislocation. 62% of these were full thickness and 30% were partial thickness. So it is a problem in the older patient with an anterior dislocation. Kim, Kim et al. looked at which tendons are involved in this population group following a, a first time anterior dislocation. And they found that 47% had isolated rotator cuff tears. 52% had a combination of both a cuff tear and a Bankart tear. There was a higher degree of fatty degeneration for tears of supraspinatus and infraspinatus without a Bankart tear, but this did not apply for tears of subscapularis without a Bankart tear. The subscapularis tear is significant in this age group. The older the patient, the greater the size of the tear, more likely to have two tendon tears and biceps tears, and the younger the patient, less than 60, were more likely to have labral tears. But there is a caveat. Rotator cuff tears and shoulder instability is not only about the old or the elderly patient. In anterior instability in patients less than 40 years, 5 to 7% will have a rotator cuff tear. It is less common, but it is not rare. And rotator cuff tears in anterior instability in the young patient is especially associated with collision sports. In the rugby shoulder, you will see it in about three to 10% of the shoulder injuries. So in patients with, so the first point about this talk is that in patients with anterior shoulder instability, rotator cuff tears are more common in patients greater than 40 years old. However, rotator cuff tears do occur in younger patients especially those involved in collision sports. Rotator cuff tears in anterior instability is not a disease isolated to older patients only. So then the question is, how should we treat the older patient with a rotator cuff tear and an anterior shoulder dislocation? And the first point is that we know that the incidence of recurrent instability in patients older than 40 years is low, less than 10%. And we've seen studies from 1956 to 2002 that have demonstrated, that, that, that have shown this. We also know that the injury pattern is different from the younger patients. 
In older patients, they more commonly have fractures, that is, of the, especially of the tuberosity, the greater tuberosity and glenoid, and neurological injuries are more common, with in, with in some studies showing 50 to 60% having an associated axillary nerve, axillary nerve compromise. So how do we make sense of this clinical data in practice? And the first point is that initial treatment of the older patient with a, with a first-time anterior dislocation is usually conservative. It is initially conservative treatment, especially if you're dealing with a first-time dislocation. After reduction, the shoulder is stable and has functional range of movement. There is no fracture or an undisplaced fracture. There is good rotator cuff function with no rotator cuff, with, with either no rotator cuff tear or a chronic rotator cuff tear, and the subscapularis is intact. The next point, the second major point of my talk is that this will apply to nine out of 10, 90% of your patients with a full thickness anterior dislocation after 40, greater than 40 years. So in clinical practice, in the majority of older patients greater than 40 years with anterior shoulder instability and an associated rotator cuff tear, management is conservative. So consider then this clinical scenario. At three to six week review following a dislocation in the older patient, the presentation is persisting pain, weakness, limited range of movement or instability. It is that patient that will need further assessment. A, a specific set of x-rays, neurological review, probably also nerve conduction studies, and further imaging depending on what, depending on the policy of the unit you're in. And therefore, what you're trying to identify is which patient should be considered for surgery. And the generally accepted indications for surgery are recurrent instability, a traumatic rotator cuff tear, a displaced greater tuberosity fracture, or a significant glenoid defect or fracture. Now, at a, at his, at a recent keynote lecture, Emilio Calvo, suggested that at the Berlin International Shoulder Congress, suggested that it is useful to consider this population in three groups. Group one, the younger, the young older patient, 40 to 50 years. Group two, the mature athlete, 50 to 65 years. And group three, the elderly patient, greater than 65 years. And I think in the, in, in the interest of full disclosure, it's important to know that much of what I say has been crystallized following this, le this keynote lecture by Emilio Calvo in, uh, in Berlin this year. In the older patient, in the young older patient, what is the appropriate surgical procedure today? This is the group of 40 to 50 years in whom the, and of the three groups described, this is the group least likely to have a rotator cuff tendon tear. Now, previously, previously the suggestion was that the outcome of, of a combined rotator cuff repair and a bank art repair in this group is associated with persisting stiffness. And this is uh, largely following the paper in arthroscopy in 1998. But a more recent study that compared bank art repair only with bank art repair and rotator cuff repairs in, in, the, in, in patients showed no significant difference of outcome at 44 months. So that the current suggestion is that in this group, treat both, treat the rotator cuff tear and the bank art or bony bank art tear. So you treat both the cuff tear and instability and you treat the, you treat the instability according to the protocol of preference of your, of your unit. In the second group, which is the mature athlete, 50 to 65 years, they present quite in two different groups with persisting with problems after their dislocation. They present with either a rotator cuff tear only or a rotator cuff and bank art lesion. And they are presenting with instability. In patients with a rotator cuff tear, what are the outcomes of surgery? For, for, with, uh, with rotator cuff repair only. And we have a study now by G in 2020, which showed that older patients, more than 50 years, 
follow who have a massive rotator cuff tear and an intact labrum following a dislocation achieve satisfactory functional outcomes and movement without recurrence of dislocations following an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. So it is reasonable in these patients to offer them a rotator cuff repair. Similarly, studies in 2019 by Rowe et al. and 2020 by Ch Chan et al. have shown that, the, that following rotator cuff repair and a bankrupt repair in this patient group demonstrated satisfactory functional outcome with a combined procedure. So that the recommendation in the 50 to 65 year old group currently is to treat all lesions, either rotator cuff repair only or a rotator cuff or to treat both the rotator cuff and Bankart tear. The last group is the more difficult group. These are the patients, the elderly patient greater than 65 years old with shoulder instability and a, rot and a rotator cuff tear. Now this group is more difficult and in, 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 um, presents it. In this group, it is more difficult to decide how to treat them because firstly, rotator cuff tears are more common in this age group. Secondly, the tears may often be acute on chronic. And third, the tears are off, may often be irreparable. So in the first clinical scenario, you're dealing with an elderly patient and has, who has experienced an anterior dislocation. And if you cons who's considered to have a large or massive acute tear with no severe osteoarthritis. And if the patient is medically fit, rehabilitation and early repair within the six weeks is, is reasonable as acute traumatic pseudoparalysis is considered reversible. Remember that this presentation is uncommon and it's important not to miss the diagnosis in, in this elderly group of patients. I recently had an interesting case. A patient was treated elsewhere with a, a, a dislocation, unstable dislocation of a DIP joint and a shoulder dislocation. And she was referred back uh, when she came, she was referred on return home to see an orthopedic surgeon for removal of the KY at four weeks. And in fact, she had an acute pseudoparalysis and there was no recommendation that she either attend physiotherapy or see a doctor for this. So it is important to consider this in the old, in the old doc who presents with a finger fracture and a dislocated shoulder. The second clinical scenario is the elderly patient with an anterior dislocation and a large or massive acute on chronic tear with no severe osteoarthritis. Making a decision on this patient is more difficult and should probably be more considered. It is reasonable for appropriate rehabilitation for the first three to six weeks, and then to consider repair if during this time there is definitely no improvement and the patient has a significant subscapularis tear. It is important to know, though, know that most patients will improve with therapy and will not need surgery. Now, before I go any further, in, in, it, it's a reasonable criticism for clinical scenario one and clinical scenario two to comment that this may be based more on opinion than evidence, although I hope to be able to correct that in the future. In group three, which is the elderly, uh, the elderly patient are greater than 65, is the elderly patient with shoulder instability and persisting shoulder, symptomatic shoulder instability and a definitely irreparable rotator cuff tear. Interestingly, in this group, we do have some evidence. They should be considered to fall in into two categories. That is functional. The patient has shoulder instability, an irreparable rotator cuff tear is old, but is able to elevate and rotate the shoulder or non-functional. This is the patient with a functional shoulder who becomes pseudoparalytic after injury and may or may not have arthritis. Now, if the patient is functional and has recurrent instability, there is some evidence to show that a bone block procedure is reasonable. Philip Moroda, who visited us um, uh, uh, recently, has published in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery that the latter J is a reasonable option in the pa elderly patient with anti instability and an irreparable cuff tear. And more recently, Pascal Ballot has shown that it is uh, the Trillet procedure is a reasonable option in this group. If, however, after injury, the patient becomes pseudoparalytic, 
and remains seroparalytic despite adequate conservative treatment, it is then reasonable to offer a reverse shoulder replacement and there are, there are studies available to support that decision making. So what are the take home messages? One, rotator cuff tears are associated with anterior shoulder instability more commonly in the older patient, but can occur in the younger patient, especially those involved in collision sports. In the older patient, initial treatment is conservative as, as, and, is in, as if, and is effective in the majority. The indications for surgery are a traumatic tear, a displaced bony defect or recurrent instability. Our, at surgery, address all lesions, both the, both, both, both the instability lesion and the cuff tear. For an irreparable but functional rotator cuff, a bone block procedure is a reasonable option. For an irreparable non-functional rotator cuff or arthritis, a reverse shoulder replacement is a reasonable option. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Cool. Oh, thank you very much, Leon. Yeah, that's um, also a very good step for us to follow and, and deal with these actually not uncommon problems, especially the older patient with a large rotator cuff tear. That's what we normally see is they've got a tear, how acute and how chronic it is. Any comments or questions for Leon? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it the first thing is if you see the patient who has a cuff tear, the older patient who has a cuff tear and is stiff, I will not repair the, the, the Bangkok. So that's it from personal experience and some of the previous literature saying they get stiff and don't have a recovery instability. So it's not the patient who's presenting with instability and a cup tear. They're stiff and patient with a cup tear and have a trial of hunting the cheap, etc. I think you would be very careful in that group of patients is to go tighten the capsule as well. Because in fact, if you do repair, you can actually very often tighten the capsule. Um, especially if it's involved in the, the subcap. So that's a stiff patient. Then there's the other group I think you must be very careful. It's a terrible triad. We miss. They get told they've got an auxiliary nerve palsy. And in fact, what they've got a torn rotator cuff and auxiliary nerve palsy. And I think you must be very aggressive with them because they are un, they are unsalvageable with time. You can retain function with the intact cup and a failed uh, auxiliary nerve recovery. And you you can regain function if you can repair the cuff. So I think that group of patients, very aggressive, trying to repair the cuff. Um, if, if you have the terrible triad of the shoulder, which is the dislocation, a large cuff there, and the renal palsy. And my final comment is um, it worries me of a trial of rehab in a very functional vulgar patient who's got a large cuff there, especially if it involves some of the subcapillaris. Because the New Zealand study looked at the group of people that had a fall without dislocation. And they had good healing rates in that group of patients over the age of 70. More than 70% healed their cup with good functional outcome. And I think I'm a little bit more aggressive in that group of patients uh, with a significant cup there. I'm not talking about one centimeter, I'm talking about two, three centimeter cup there. Get in early. So your comments on that, Leon, or anybody else's comments, Cameron. I'm not sure if Shan is still there or Basil. Any comments on that? So I think um, I think the patient who, who presents when they stiff after a cuff tear, instability, a cuff tear, uh, is probably is a is, is, is a difficult presentation. I certainly would not address, I, I would certainly treat them as a um, rotator cuff tear with stiffness and not instability. I would not repair the bank card. That that I would agree with. I think that I'm very aggressive about uh, treating subscapularis tears in the older patient. I think it's I, I think it should not be ignored. I think that um, uh, if they if if it's if they symptomatic, they if there's a history of injury and they're symptomatic, they deserve treatment, particularly in the absence of arthritis, and they seem to do quite well. Uh, with the auxiliary nerve, I agree with you. I I, uh, I left it out because I think it's a topic on its own. Um, I, I, my own approach is to uh, address the cuff acutely and we make a decision by three months as to whether we're going to address the, the, the auxiliary nerve or not. I'm surprised by the number who actually regain deltoid function quite quickly. The problem about leaving the cuff and rehabilitating and waiting for auxiliary nerve function is they end up with a stiff, painful, unstable shoulder by the time you think you're getting auxiliary nerve recovery again. <laughs>
So I think the idea of waiting on the terrible trial is wrong. If it's repairable, even if it's a, I find most of the, the few I've the few I've, I've addressed surgically because I treat an incredible number number of old people, um, is that they do better than I than, than I would other, otherwise have expected. And my experience of those who I've treated expectantly and conservatively is they they do badly. They develop a type of neuro, neuro, uh, almost like a neuropathic pain. So even when you get eventually to the, the deltoid gets good recovery and you eventually get to do some sort of arthroplasty or joint salvage procedure, they're never happy. Yeah. Dan, uh, Cameron, any comments? Steve, can I just make a, a, a comment, maybe ask Leon um, his approach to when, when do you think an MRI scan is indicated in these patients over 40 who have a first-time dislocation? Bearing in mind that obviously in a lot of the state institutions, we don't have easy access to MRI scans. Um, which, which patients do you really push to do an MRI scan and how does it change your decision-making? So I, uh, so um, uh, again, I, did, I, I, I chose not to address it because it, I think uh, the MRI is not useful for me in making a decision as to whether the patient requires surgery or not. MRI maybe is very useful for me. is is very useful for me to determine whether I consider the tear, whether I consider the cuff is definitely irre irreparable or not. I very rarely come across a patient who's young and healthy, and has an acute incident, has a normally functioning shoulder, an acute incident, and a completely irreparable cuff tear. Yeah. So, so I, say, and just, I just want to make a comment, but you ultrasound all those patients, so you actually have a normal x-ray and an, and an ultrasound. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, yes, yes, yeah, so I, I, so I, I, if I have a normal x-ray, I have a well-centered head, I have a rotator cuff tear, on the ultrasound, I don't have evidence of muscle, muscle, massive muscle atrophy, and the patients had good functioning shoulder beforehand, I would consider that to be a, a traumatic, and the closer they are to 40, the more likely I am to offer them surgery. If there is a history of having, a background history of having shoulder pain prior, prior to the tra traumatic incident with a decreased functioning following the traumatic incident, I think I would then consider an MRI scan. But I'd make the diagnosis of a tear on the on, on absence or presence of a tear on ultrasound. Any other comments? Uh, Sam? Steve, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we know that dislocations uh, with cuff tears is a different kind of problem, especially in the older patients. So for me, it's more about the cuff integrity that I'm concerned about. So if I have an older patient, I mean, concerned about the cuff, I'm not worried too much about the instability pattern unless that becomes a problem with time, which is probably not a very significant problem. So yes, if I have a subcap tear, I'll definitely repair it. If I have a supraspinatus tear, well, any rotator cuff tear, I'm inclined to want to repair these following a dislocation. Uh, regarding the bank cards, um, the younger patients I might consider both, but generally I would tend to ignore it because quite often they don't have a bank card lesion, they have a capsular lesion in combination with this. So more the cuff is what I would be interested in in the older patients. I'm going to make one last comment on the on the Vladisha or the Trilla procedure. I've done a couple, been a little bit disappointed um, in them. And I, I think it raises two other problems because our salvage procedure for them is a reverse shoulder. Now we've got two screws in the front. You've got an altered glenoid and you've changed your biomechanics of your shoulder, which um, we just got published on saying how we lose forward elevation and the, the effect of the conjoint tendon on the reverse shoulder. So it does alter your biomechanics and possibly your surgery. And I'll show you previous surgery increases your sepsis rate just now. So I, I, maybe those ones we must be careful about doing a toilet procedure or, um, or bone block. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Cameron is next on decision making on first time and recurrent dislocations, recent uh, consensus studies. And let's see, can you share the share? Okay, you're going to get us to share this. I mean, you can to share it. Okay. 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 
There you go. Uh, I just think it's going to be I know you must click on the screen there. Which one? Yeah. On that screen. That should be sure. We'll be there. Okay. Yeah. How do you do this? Drag it to the screen. Yeah, drag it. But if you want to make one of the old keys of the canyon, yeah, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. We also did that to share the screen to so the other people that's here. You just do that for me. Yeah, there you go. See how they all present the And then just turn it over. Okay, they're going to leave it there on the head of the which is moved on the way. Okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, thanks to Steve and you, Sham and uh, Leon, for joining us. Uh, so, my uh, talk is around shoulder instability, trying to look at um, what we can do to try and reduce it and re reduce recurrence and find an operation that we're allowed to do as shoulder surgeons because we're not allowed to operate on fractures. Looks like cuffs we're not allowed to operate on, so we're trying to find something to keep us in business. Yay. I'm not used to that bronze thing. Okay. Okay. So the shoulder is the most dislocated shoulder uh, joint with up to 45% dislocation. Uh, the majority of patients are what you call young males, 15 to 25 years old, uh, mostly injured in contact sports in South Africa, mostly our rugby players and, and, and mountain bikers. And then there's a second peak, as always in orthopedics, with fairly uh, older ladies dislocating their shoulders. Um, so there's various ways that these are described in the literature. So you get your acute dislocation, which for me can be divided into a first-time dislocation and recurrent instability. So an acute dislocation and someone who's had a dislocation before. And some articles will refer to recurrent instability as chronic dislocations or chronic instability. Uh, so there's a recent EFORT article that's just been published and its title is chronic instability, but in fact, it's, in my mind, it's recurrent instability. For us, chronic instability is someone who's had a dislocated shoulder and now they're now presenting down the line with it still dislocated and then we know about the multi-directional instability so for the acute dislocation as we know it's important to do a good clinical examination prior to any intervention exclude associated injuries especially if there's been a high impact uh, either accident or someone who's come off their mountain bike look for cervical spine injuries uh, and, and do a good neurological examination the literature there's, a, there's quite a difference in, in clinical and EMG studies, as you would expect, in terms of what the exact incidence of nerve or auxiliary nerve injuries is, but probably settles at about 3% in the literature. But some studies showing much higher, especially when EMG is included. Unfortunately, brachial plexus or lower brachial plexus injuries are much less common, and, and vascular injuries is shown to be about 0.3%. So, so very unlikely. Uh, but it's important to look for these, especially before you do any reduction maneuvers, because if it was there afterwards, now you're not sure. And if you can't document that, it's, if you can't test it prior to the dislocation or re reduction, then you need to document that you at least tried. But generally, between feeling the side impact and just gently getting the patient to try and contract their, their, their deltoid, you can say if it's intact or not, but sometimes with the pain, it's difficult. And then as always, you've got your pre and post reduction films, AP, lateral, and an auxiliary view, which is essential. In terms of the, 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 man, the maneuver used, there's a variety described. I uh, always get asked, what's the best one? I know Prof Roche has got his, his, his method, which works very well for him. For me, it's the one that's safe and the one that you've had the most success with. And this study basically showed that attraction and counter-attraction uh, in a more controlled environment is the best. But, but there's lots of different um, uh, methods that have been described, some that the patient does by themselves, some with counter-traction, some with just gentle manipulation. Just remember, in an elderly patient, avoid the cocha. And I think the days of putting our foot into the axilla have probably moved on now. In terms of classification, there's a variety of classifications. Again, the standard animal classification, Gerber's classification. And more recently, it's abbreviated as the FEDS. So it just gives you important factors to consider. 
how often has the, the shoulder dislocated? So that's frequency, was it traumatic or not? So is it a half relaxed patient or not? So that's the etiology, the direction, anterior, we know that about 95% are anterior. Maybe we see more and more posterior now, so maybe that percentage will decrease as we see more posterior. And that's, and then it's severity in terms of, is it just a subluxation or is it a complete dislocation? So what are the consequences of recurrent dislocation? Why is this actually something that we need to look at? Uh, and, and is it really that bad to have a second dislocation? So we know that with each, this study showed that which, with each um, dislocation there's increased bone loss. And we know that if there's increased bone loss, that can firstly, it can cause an easier third or fourth dislocation, and it might change the, the treatment that this patient requires. So this study showed that with one dislocation, there was 3.5%, went up to 11% of the current. And this study showed that if there was, looking at different types of athletes, so we know that we, from, from our experience, we know that rugby has a higher impact. And this study confirms that. And this is where the discrepancy, which we'll discuss later, I think is borne out. This is the amount of bone loss that we see, especially in our rugby players, where this study showed an average 12% versus baseball or other overhead type athletes, uh, which is much lower down in the four to five percent. Then every time you dislocate, you have that that six percent or five percent or up to twenty percent, depending on what you read of a, of a nerve injury. So we want to try and avoid that. And then there was a study which showed that the overall rate of arthropathy or arthritis is twenty nine percent, and but it was significantly different between uh, a recurrent dislocation and without. It. Uh, dislocation. So 18% for first time dislocators, and it went up significantly to almost 40% with recurrent dislocation. So I think those are three important reasons why we want to try and avoid dislocations in itself. Um, in South Africa, we're blessed with some amazing wildlife, which makes some very good collective nouns, like a crash of rhino and a, and a confusion of shoulder surgeons. So I think as we go through every, all the literature, we cannot agree, as you have seen in the previous lectures, it's too hard to address these patients. And this was borne out in mostly an American study where there was only 5% of the 160 scenarios reached some sort of consensus. But I'll try to make some sense of what has been published and hopefully come to some sort of structure as to how we can manage these dislocations or when we should operate and how we should operate. So it goes without saying that our goal of treatment in a patient with a dislocation is to prevent a second dislocation, because we know that that will increase the bone loss potentially, put them at risk for more in the auxiliary nerve and, and increase um, arthritis down the line. And this was a study which I'm not sure how it got through ethics, but it was a randomized double blind trial looking at basically half the patients got a scope and a debridement, and the other half got a scope and a, a bank heart repair. And this study showed that there was a significant difference, as we'd expect, between the two groups down the line. An 82% reduction is the way that they phrased it in dislocations in the group where the bank heart was performed. Another meta-analysis uh, showed um, that there's a significant decrease of recurrent instability in young males uh, with stabilization. So the literature does support that surgery can prevent uh, recurrence. In terms of return to function, which is our other goal, um, it, it, it's been shown in various studies that not only do we get patients back to sport, but also to uh, their, their daily activities and jobs. The one uh, aspect to consider, though, is that return to sport is varies depending on the on the procedure done. And I think it's, it is very important, though, that we must take some bias a lot of the literature is American. Their contact athletes or athletes are slightly different, as we've seen in those other studies. So I don't really worry about the figures here so much, but just to say that there's a high return to sport uh, with surgery after, after an instability episode. However, as we've has been shown across all literature, when you're trying to get a patient back to the level of sport, it can be challenging. So the day-to-day -day back to sport is easy, but a high level, an international level, is more difficult and not always as successful. And it's important to stress that to any athlete before operating on them. But one of the ways that we can try and prevent the recurrence is knowing who is likely to re-dislocate. Because it's, it's not a case of, okay, we know we mustn't re-dislocate. Everybody must now get an operation. We need to balance that with saying, well, some patients are going to be at risk of a, of a complication if we operate on 
So we want to try and find the right patient, the sweet spot of saying these patients will benefit the most and these patients are unlikely to redislocate, so we don't need to operate on them. So we can take into account a variety of factors. And one of the important factors is, as we know, the patient factors. And this is looking at the age of the patient and, and the literature shows less than 25, maybe less than 30, depending on your read, you've got a higher rate of redislocation. Some literature would say below 20, you've got a 95% chance of redislocating. And that does decrease as we get older. And we've seen, well, there are other consequences of a dislocation in an elderly patient, like a rotator cuff tear. But for redislocation and instability, it becomes less likely. And we know also other patient factors to consider is the, the level of exercise that the patient wants to do, how active they are. Is it uh, Ruan Pinar, who's at 39, still playing curry cup rugby? Or is it someone who just wants to be sort of a weekend warrior and is happy with, uh, with, with taking their chances on their mountain bike, hoping that they don't have another accident? So it's important to say what sport do they want to do and what level do they want to compete at? The next uh, factors to other factors to consider are what, what happened due to the instability. So how much glenoid bone loss is there? This can be measured in various ways, specifically on a CT scan. And then we know if we put that together with the hill sacs, then we come, they've come up with the concept of the on-track or off-track lesion. And just, I'm sure you understand it, I'm sure Prof has, has explained it to you, but as you know, the glenoid is basically your track. And if you paint that track, and then you get the patient to do 360 through their arm, whatever is painted on the outside within the cuff, that's your track. So anything that falls, so if you've got a hill sex that is now bigger than that, becomes an off-track lesion, or you've got a very small track with a reasonable side hill sex, it becomes an off-track lesion. And as we know, an off-track lesion is bad. So we want to avoid an off-track lesion and try and prevent an off-track lesion from occurring. So if you've got an off-track lesion, you've got a higher risk of redislocation. And now the literature isn't happy just with off-track, so they put, there's a new concept of almost off-track. Then looking at soft tissue injuries, we know that these are very common. Uh, this was a paper that put together the soft tissue injuries we can expect, and you can see that up to 96% of patients will have a bank heart lesion. And then along with the hill sacs, which is 93%, less likely to find an ulcer lesion, or a Hagel lesion, but it's important to look out for those because those can definitely catch you out. And then that can is all put together very nicely in the, the paper that, um, that Prof and, and Jimmy put together for the SOJ. So it's a good paper to go through. It highlights all these different factors when you're starting to think about how to treat these patients. And another, uh, just one slide on this, looking at the different sets uh, of, of examinations that can be done. And this is more for your recurrent dislocation or your micro instability and the sensitivity and the specificity showing that the anterior apprehension is probably the best and with the relocation test, uh, the most specific and sensitive. And then the jerk test and Kim test for posterior instability. All right, so once we've got there, we've now sort of got to the idea that we need to operate in young patients. Um, and now we've got to start deciding what operation are we going to do. And this, there is a bit of a bias in this as well in the literature based on where the, the data is published from. The European literature is more latige heavy and the American literature is more bank art or soft tissue heavy. But those are, in, in essence, your options that you have. You have a bank heart repair, which can be done openly or arthroscopically. You can add a rep massage to this, where at the posterior aspect, you fill in, as the French word says, the muscle into the posterior aspect. Uh, and then you've got your bony block procedures, which is the classic, as we know, is an open latige, where you take a coracoid with a short head of biceps that attach to it, and you, you plug that into the anterior aspect of the the glenoid, it's got, it's classically, it's got, it's, it's increasing your track in essence, and the sling effect of the bicep helps to keep the head in place. And then you've got the Eden Hibernate, which is where you take a piece of bone out of the hip. Uh, there are other uh, donor sites, such as the lateral clavicle, but maybe not as big, which can also be used. So trying to make sense of how to go about where to go with these different operations is quite complex. And unfortunately, it's made more complex when you look into the literature. So one of the first uh, scores that, that was devised to try and help us to decide, and remember this instability score, which was initially published, is not published to when to operate, it's published that when you've decided to operate, what procedure to do, and originally was looking at the bank heart versus the latigee. Uh, 
And the original score of six then became five, then became four, and now some probably three. But if you look at that, almost everybody ends up with a latter shape. However, this does give you some indication and reminder of what factors to consider when making a decision about when to operate, I mean, what operation to do. So it helps you to remember, look at their age, look at the type of sport that they want to do and what level they want to compete at. Is there any hyperlaxity? And then originally the score had x-rays, but now more recently, we use the on-track and the off-track to get the four points. So looking at this, as I said, there's no score that has been shown to be the gold standard, but it helps us to remember that there's important factors to consider. And if you look at these uh, algorithms which have been published, unfortunately, you'll see that it's, they're quite broad in their nature. So the one on the left, which is basically recurrent instability, or they named it uh, chronic instability, they give risk factors. Um, and then they say no risk factors, you can do a, lat a latige, a, a bank card repair with a remplissage or just a bank card repair. And then for the no bone loss, they basically give one less option. They're saying don't worry about the, the remplis, uh, the, the bank card repair, and as they move through. So it's quite a broad spectrum, and it really, in my mind, gives us an indication. It doesn't give us a nice solid answer. Other, other uh, algorithms look more at the bone loss, but as you can see from here, this one looks at 13% to 20%, 20 to 40, and more than 40. Whereas these ones look at 13 to 17, uh, 17 to 20, more than 20 to 25, and then also trying to put together on track and off track and looking at 13%. So that critical amount of bone loss has not been deciphered yet in my mind. I think the least that it is is about 13%, and that's when most surgeons would start thinking there's critical bone loss. However, I think it's quite common in South Africa that we don't really focus too much on amount of bone. We look more at our patients and say, this patient is a high contact, in, it, 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 there's a lot of exercise energy going through his shoulder or her shoulder when they're doing their sport, and therefore we're going to be more towards the latige, or they're not as high contact, let's try the, 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 the remplissage with the bankard. And I think the remplissage is maybe slightly underutilized. Um, it's been shown, and again, this comes with the understanding that this was a study done in America with not a lot of rugby players, but they showed good results uh, to return to sport after an arthroscopic bank heart with the remplissage. And I think that's where a lot of the literature is moving. What does the addition of the remplissage do to the dislocation rate and the complication rate when helping to look at, at how to treat these patients? However, it's important to remember that these are not necessarily done in our contact sports. Movement. And the one before you carry on, I just want to highlight one of the problems with all these papers. It's actually in there, it's in this paper. Yeah. Look at the age 28 years of age, from 14 to 72. Yeah. And once you pull the data like that, it becomes almost meaningless for me because you're not selecting the group up. You could do anything to a 40 year old, they'll be stable. You can't, unless, you, unless you've got bone loss. I tell you, you've got to go look at the 14 year olds and the people who return to the So when we get a pool data like this, it is very, it's unfortunately, I think, misleading every single time. Sorry. Yeah, no, 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 I think, I think just, if you just look at that there, yeah, I think, the, I think 20, the, 14 to 17. So I went to look at that because I saw that. Yeah. You've operated on. You've discussed it lots. And, but most in this study, a lot of the patients were in that less than forty. It's just unfortunately they've given the range. They haven't given the mean. Well, they've given the mean. Well, the average is still twenty-eight. Yeah. So there, there was a reasonable number of young, but but it's definitely something to consider. Um, but importantly, these patients they they're a bit hesitant in America to do it in the patient the overhead athletes because of the loss of external rotation. So then looking at the Latige versus the Bagcott and, and, and the, the study you can, on, on the left, um, there's Peter Millet's group um, and a very high success rate of return to, to sport uh, with the Latige with a low redislocation rate. Um, and then looking at a slightly older paper, comparing the two and again saying good outcomes in the Latige and the Bagcott, but starting to find a trend of a higher redislocation rate with the Bagcott versus the Latige. So it certainly does push us to say you can get both can get the patient back to sport. However, if you want them to stay playing their sport, we know that a latiche does better in a contact act. But in the general run of the mill, maybe a bank heart, maybe now with a reptisage, is, is it appropriate? And I'll get to that just now. Uh, and again, looking at this in the subcritical and the amount of bone loss, 
um, showing reasonable results in both groups. So I just want to end on this paper in terms of the papers, and this is the, the one where they've got 130 at, uh, rugby players divided up into two groups, one of 80, which had the uh, Bankart, and 50, which had the Latige. And again, excellent functional outcomes in both. But the last line is the clincher for me, significantly higher rate of recurrence, 20% versus 4% with the Bankart group, and therefore a much higher reoperation rate in our rugby players. And that's where we in South Africa tend to, to, to focus a lot on instability. However, I think it's important that we should still bear in mind that the Bankart and the Remplissage in the less active, um, younger patient may still have a role. So my summary is not based on age, it's based on a young and active patient. I think there is certainly benefit for a first-time dislocation to offer this patient surgery. We reduce the rate of recurrence. We know that the, the recurrence has its negative aspects of increasing bone loss, which may change operation from a soft tissue procedure to a bony procedure. The auxiliary nerve is at, at risk every time, and you may reduce significantly the amount of arthritis they have down the line. If they're not so young, and I put it not so young intentionally to be vague because we don't know what that means, but we're probably talking about around the 40 year old. Uh, the redislocation rate is low, so we can give them a trial of non-operative management if their lifestyle is ex accepts that. And then in the, the not young, so the older patients, apart from what, what Leon mentioned, uh, because the recurrent rate is much lower, uh, and, and if they don't have a rotator cuff tear, we can, we can probably give them conservative treatment. So what to do, in, in essence, we've got three options. For me, we've got the bank heart, the remplissage, and the bone reconstruction. And the bank heart and the remplissage often go together, and then the bony reconstruction is on its own. In, in, if you're looking at the literature, I normally sort of discuss it with my patients, and it's a little bit of an inverse proportion, and, and, and using the literature is slightly dangerous because I think it does inflate the figures slightly. But if you look at a bank heart, and maybe it's slightly lower with the remplissage, but if you say to them the bank heart, they've got about a 15% chance of redislocation, but they've got a 2 to 5% charge of a, of a complication. Inversely to that, if you do a latige, they've got about a 5% redislocation rate, but they've got a 15% complication rate. Maybe Prof who does a lot more latige the complication rate's lower, and there are studies that shows it's around 6%, but there is certainly more risk with the latige. However, you've got to look at that redislocation rate and discuss it with your patient and say, which angle do we want to go to? And once again, in our rugby players, we know that he's back playing rugby after he had an excellent surgeon. And now we know that we must individualize each patient to make sure that they get the treatment that they need. It's not a one size fits all first dislocation equals an operation. It's a one size, I mean, it's a, it's a individualized, what, what is your activity level? What is your age? What is your risk of redislocation? then deciding about surgery, but fairly aggressively in younger patients, and what to do depends a lot on, on your skills, I suppose, uh, but also taking into account the redislocation rates and the complication rates. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for coming. Another very good talk. And so, yeah, so three outstanding talk today and, and giving some clear indications which routes we should be taking. And um, this one's a little bit not as uh, direct because you do have different options and as Cameron says you discuss it more with the patient while with the other two talks you could have there's some fairly clear routes that we're going to take in our clinical decision making so I, I, I think to to back up what Cameron was saying because he knows I'm so pro that is it. if you have an operation and you are septic and you lose your joint at 23 it's very different to having a second dislocation so when you counsel a patient, it must be a clear understanding with them that there is a risk of surgery. Because we are very quick to operate because you tell them, you know, we're going to be dislocated. You must have an operation. You play rugby, you want to carry on playing. But I tell you, he won't play rugby if he's septic and his instability surgery has failed. So when you counsel your patient, there must be a clear understanding of the risk and complication of surgery and the outcomes of, of of not having surgery. So um, having said that, my son on Saturday dislocated on Monday was having surgery. So in my mind, it's fairly clear, but it, it, it is, it, you, you have to have that discussion with your patient.
I'm not sure. I know Bill had to go. Sham, do you have any comments or JP, Basil, Taze, anybody else? Yeah, Steve, yes. I'm just a question to Cameron. You talk about early surgery for the young first time dislocators. What is early? You know, is it the first few days after injury? Do you wait a week or two to let the acute inflammatory phase settle like they do in ACLs? Because if you do them too early, they can end up quite stiff. But the question is when, or do you have a cutoff point as to when you would actually consider surgery for the first time dislocators? At, at what point? Uh, Shan, it's a good question. I don't really have a specific cutoff where I would say I wouldn't operate because it's too early. Um, I think in our setting, it would be almost based on convenience, not necessarily on, on saying we must wait at least 10 days and you must do a bit of prehab. So for me, there's no specific cutoff and, and I haven't found anything in the literature. I'm not sure if any of the other guys or anyone else has an opinion on that, but for me, it's, it's, it's almost going to be on convenience on list availability um, and any other injuries that the patient may have. I don't know if you have a cutoff for. Yeah. No, I don't actually. I, what I don't like is doing is operating with a very stiff patient. And remarkably, most of these patients recover very quickly after their dislocation, unless they've got another injury, a bicep injury or a, a big um, osteochondral injury. And most of them are actually not that stiff at the beginning. My one or two patients I have operated, even the I remember the first one I ever encountered was at five dislocations. He came into the room and he said he wanted an operation. He was 23 and 3, 24. He was very stiff when I saw him. And unfortunately, I did an operation and for 18 months he was very stiff after it. So in the stiff patients, I'm very careful about early operations. Sam, you've got a different opinion? Uh, Steve. Sorry, no. Oops. sorry, I thought it was a question to me. Now, I, I kind of follow it for much like the ACLs, you know, do them when they are quiet, means when they have no inflammatory phase and they have done any stiffness. So I might wait a week to two weeks and see how they do before I operate on them. My experience is that if I do them too early, I've had quite a few patients who ended up being a bit stiff and took a little longer to recover from. And that was the reason for my question. Any other comments? Steve, just the one thing. Um, if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of our patients decide what they're going to have. They walk in and they say, Doc, I've got this shoulder problem and I want the bony operation, especially the rugby players, because they're very well informed. And they'll say, my mate had that operation. So sometimes the decision is very really easy for us. But I, I mean, we see that quite often where they decide. They've decided before they even see you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I will make a comment that in Cape Town, when with the, our Western Cape group, they, they weren't quite believers that the, their back was did so badly until we said, okay, let us open your box. And the guys were very kindly did, and JP followed 140, and our recurrence rate was about 20%. JP can confirm that. But if they play rugby, they had a 40% recurrence rate. And these are people who already been pre selected out with bony lesion. So, uh, so yeah. I mean, I learned pretty early because I had some very grumpy rugby players who dislocated the next season who had no bony injury and had a left And in fact, to go back to Len Funk, I always use the same story. Len Funk didn't believe me either. Go and look at his literature. If you're under 16, his recurrence rate is nearly 90% if you play rugby. So they, it wasn't only me who was a terrible surgeon. There were other people out there as well who couldn't do bank art repairs. I think another important aspect which the literature does point to is that it's not just a full dislocation, it's also the patient who's subluxing and is unhappy. So you might not have an evidence of a dislocation, but clinically they are still subluxing with the with the bank cards um, and maybe with the remplissoid. And, and that's also so so you don't have a failure in terms of a full dislocation, but you have an unhappy patient because they are still subluxing. Uh, I have two pa three patients who've had a, a ladder on one side and a bank card at the same sitting because for many reasons. And I tell you what, they are, they say they should, their latage side is stronger than the bad shoulder. I mean, their good shoulder when it was good and it's better than the bank card. All of them. So, and then that's it, borne out in literature as well. The, the latage are actually are better than the bank card. They still have some discomfort and not at the top there. I think the latage in, in essence is, 
we talk about latch but the bony procedures are changing. There are newer techniques to be designed, uh, as you know. Um, so maybe using other bone blocks and using different fixation devices um, that maybe will, will also change the face of how we do these, these procedures. But in essence, it's a bony procedure. We tend to do a bank card and a latch at the same time. For those four percent that have a failure, so we're trying to reduce all the complications of that down. Makes it a little bit stiff at the beginning, but I'm not sure. Ashley, you want to say something? I mean, in your practice, what proportion of your patients with uh, shoulder instability you do like a bank card versus a uh, lactate? Well, I don't have an uh, international rugby practice, so <laughs> I probably have a fairly even split um, between the, the bank cards. And I, I think. Um, maybe because my patient's not as high demand, I have started doing some more bank art with reemphasizers. Um, but I still, you know, I would say 50 50. But I think with, with Basil and, 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 and Steve and JP, their practices which focus more on the rugby players is probably much higher. And maybe it's because they're much more confident with the letter J than I am. Um, but it also plays a role, I suppose. Yeah, in a state practice as well, we see our patients are three to ten does the gate to a majority and bone loss. So even in the state, we, we tend to practice uh, with the bony procedure and the other ones. Okay. okay, let's get on. Um, so this is the article we've got to read if you want to uh, talk about periprosthetic infection after the first shoulder replacement. It's only back in 2020. I'm just try and trim that down. And, and Basically, we give you the guidelines and I'm going to go through this paper because it highlights many of the other things that we uh, that we're going to talk about reverse short. And as I said earlier, up to in some places, up to 80% of patients get a reverse now. Uh, people don't like being anatomics because the glenoid comes loose over time, and uh, maybe surgically a little bit easier. Uh, technically, they um, the glenoid doesn't come loose, and and it solves your rotator cuff problem. And if there's any bony deformity, inclination, or other reason, but that's for another talk today. So the problem is that, and the reason I'm bringing it, I'm not using it just in, in the in the, the sepsis or the bone infection unit discussion, is that the shoulder shoulder sepsis is not the same as the other paper. And um, this paper highlighted after the uh, international consensus uh, meeting regarding. Very prosthetic infections. She goes on to state that the, the diagnostic tests in the shoulder do not appear to be as sensitive when compared to the FMD literature. Our success with first stage, with single stage, is better than two stage. In fact, our very late in morbidity and uh, outcomes are worse probably as two stage uh, um, revisions. And we have this other problem of unexpected positive cultures. At the time of, uh, of revision arthroplasty, when we're not expecting sepsis. So, if we look at the sepsis, it's, it's quoted between 0.5 and 6.7 percent, with an average of 3 to 4 percent, which is higher than the anatomic control pain, and it's certainly higher than hips, maybe a little bit higher than knee replacements. I think they also have some problems. And it's listed as being about 13 percent of the complications of reverse shoulder replacement. So it's, it's a problem. And if you look at the early literature, the infection rate was up to 15%. That was because the reverse at that stage was really a salvage procedure after probably many patients had previous other operations and other comorbidities. And it was a lure for that group rather than the general population, as it now. So this is really based on the 2018 International Consensus Meeting on musculoskeletal Infection, which you've heard about, again. But the specifics for the shoulder, they went on to say is not the same as the hip and knee because we're translating the evidence from them to the shoulder, which doesn't seem to be the same. And one of the reasons is that um, GT bacterium acnes, which is found at primary surgery, is an unexpected positive culture. And in fact, if they looked at they looked at the young group of people having back heart repairs, and just under 20% had QT bacterium acnes from the time of surgery. Without going into surgery. So some people even go on to say it's a natural organism of the shoulder, which I can't quite believe. So uh, it's definitely more common than the hip and the knee. And they've broken it down like with the other ones in two. Definite infection, probable, possible, and unlikely infection to try and give us guidelines on who gets treatment and which type of procedure. So if we look at the, the, the definition, a definite infection is a sinus tract from the skin surface to the prosthesis or gross intratractor or pus or two positive cultures 
with identical virulent organism. Probable is greater than six minor criteria or equal with identified organism, and possible is the same, but a, uh, without an identified organism or low vir virulent organism. And finally, unlike the infection, less than six minor criteria, negative cultures or positive culture with a low virulent. So it's still very difficult if you're worried about a painful joint that has one positive organism and none of the other criteria, you're still in this space of and you're going to do a two-stage revision. So these are the minor criteria, and you can see uh, what they are. I'm not going to, you can read the paper to have a look at it, but it's pretty much the same as the knee, and a high weight on, on wound drainage in a single positive culture, uh, followed by humeral loosening and a couple of other ones. Okay, so we know that there are certain patients who are at risk. So if we know those patients are at risk, maybe we can adjust them. Well, I'm not sure that you can change your gender when you're older, or reverse shoulder replacement. Surprisingly, the younger patients are more at risk. And I'm not sure why is that. Is that because when you do a reverse in the younger patients, they've had previous surgery or they've got a more complicated problem. Um, and then the uh, HbA1c, if it's greater than one eight milligram. So, but they actually go on to say the diabetes doesn't seem to be a problem, but they're not sure. But if your HbA1c is higher than that, you seem to be a higher risk. BMI is also controversial. I mean, most of us think that the increased BMI increased sepsis, but in fact, it's not really been proven. Smoking has been shown, and these, the following two, four have also been associated with hemodiagnosis, with an increased risk of action. Surprising, not in the transplant patients, which is so we can't really, you can try and stop people smoking and try and stop them having from, from try and get them to lose weight and, and, and get their diabetes in control. But, Certainly, it's very difficult to, to intervene at that stage in the patients. We also know those patients are at risk. We'll talk about why it's important to know those, uh, these things because some of your interventions later may play a role. Previous non arthroplasty surgery, so if you've had a rotated cap repair, back out, or instability operation, like I was saying, you're going to do a coracoid transfer for massive irritable care cut there, and then they probably should just go straight to reverse you, increasing the risk of an infection. Certainly, it's now becoming more obvious that if you have a steroid rejection within three months of your replacement, you're jeopardizing. You have two times increased risk of having a sepsis. So you've got to try and avoid it if it, at all costs if you can't. If you're undergoing a reverse for a fracture or revision reverse, both of these, or revision of a total shoulder replacement, and increased post-op anticoagulation. If you look at some of the nieces, are very keen to give it to you. The evidence is poor on it, especially around the shoulder. So you really must have an at-risk patient give them anticoagulation. And I'm not sure, did you find anemia and sepsis? Um, um, yeah, I did, sure. So, so anemia has definitely been shown in the other joints to increase risk of sepsis and complication. So your anemia must be corrected prior to sure. So what about the microbiology? The Tutti bacteria count up 28 to 9, 79%. To 9%. And the one of the difficulties it's a biofilm organ forming organism. So we know this is a problem. First, in, uh, in treating these patients and also um, sometimes actually diagnosing the TG bacteria because it's, it's you know, almost anaerobic and it's got the biofilm so it's harder to find. Um, but there is some controversy because um, we're not sure it does cause infection, but we've seen acute parallel two liter pus in the shoulder with the six organism, six uh, biopsy showing QT bacterium. So it can be an acute environment for me, think, but very often it's an indolent um, type of infection. The imaging is actually surprisingly mostly on x ray. If you've got loosening, especially of the humeral compound, if you're, you've got osteoblasts of the humerus, you've got a tenfold risk of having QT bacteria and magnesium as part of your, of your, your um, infection profile. So loosening is important. So the CT doesn't really help us much on loosening and it doesn't show infection. So the role of CT scan, except if you're using as part of your planning on your revision, is not helpful for diagnosing sepsis. Um, if you're in doubt about loosening around the glen, it's sometimes painful, but it is helpful in, in, in deciding for a painful reverse because you're considering, is it infected or does there a stress factor, something I'm saying. CT is not, in sepsis, it doesn't really help, but it may help you decide is there a fracture or something else. And the MRI, because the metal artifact is, is, is not helpful, but there are some studies showing that MRI with contrast 
if you've got rim enhancement and some other evidence, it, it, it may help, but it actually is of limited value. PECs and spec scans and Rysol scans, Rysol labeling is not being recommended by the consensus group. We have been looking at it, sir. Jimmy looked at it. When it was positive, it was positive. When it was negative, it didn't mean much. So it didn't help. But it does help if you're doing that group that you're not sure is there a low grade sepsis, is there a stress fracture, is there, are there cramming, or is there really loosening? It may help. So you're trying to see if you can define it better for future use. Uh, unlike the other joints, the laboratory results are, are usually much lower and, and not sensitive. So as you can see, um, the sensitivity is really low for most of our blood tests. And in fact, it also is not helpful because 25 to 30 percent undergoing primary arthroplasty should you have raised markers. So they already raised before. So how are they going to help you raise the optics? But clearly, if your CRP is 120, you have an infection until proven otherwise. So I know the fluid analysis is really being taken from the hip and knee, and it definitely is not as good as in the hip and knee. One, because there's a lot of dry taps, up to 45% of dry taps when you're doing it. And it's, it's not sensitive or specific to be recommended by the consensus group. Um, and the values have been recommended from the knee, hip and knee have not been validated in the shoulder. And if you look at 75% uh, specificity and 96% in the lab case, using the alpha defensor, we're not using it. And it is not being recommended by the ICM. What about biopsies? So if you do a biopsy, it's much more important than aspirations. An open biopsy tissue culture at the time of surgery had a positive orthoscopic culture. So if you did a scope or did an open biopsy prior to your vision, you had 100% sensitivity of specificity. And how does that help you? Well, it might guide you to doing a one stage because if you know the organism, you can do a one stage. Remember, you must have a sensitive organism and you can do a one stage. So it does help. So in those patients, you're not sure having an infection. There may be, the, there is a role for an orthoscopic synovectomy biopsy at open or orthoscopic. And we'll talk about that a little bit later about actually retention of their procedures. So preoperative aspiration at only a 16% sensitivity. So, I mean, we get kept on told at some of our meetings, oh no, just put a needle in and suck it out and take send off the fluid. Well, I'm sorry, unless there's a big collection and it looks prevalent, I, I'm not sure it really helps. So we don't really use aspiration. They looked at the uh, capsule of a needle biopsy, not an aspiration, but a needle biopsy in 17 patients undergoing revision arthroplasty, and that had an 80% sensitivity and 100%. So you could consider that as an alternative to an open or arthroscopic biopsy. Um, so they also looked at tissue sampling prior to revision, so it does, does likely have a, a role as an adjunct to the work, work up of PJI. So those are the patients you're not sure, they've got a well fixed prosthesis. You're not sure if they're infected. You don't want to go and do a one stage or a two stage revision. So maybe it's better to go and do a biopsy and then, be, and, and, and then if you come back positive, then you know how, how, how sensitive, sensitive and specific it is. Okay. So, same recommendations that we have five tissue specimens. I normally take six. I'm not sure why. But maybe I'm going to go down to five. I don't know. You must do it for 14 days. And in fact, I've now had some patients come back. After their 14 days have been reported, so they kept it on. So for patients who are negative at 14 days, or I'm still suspicious, I ask them for prolonged current cultures. And I've seen candida and cutie bacterium growth. So I go even longer now. I find people I'm suspicious that I'm not happy with. Interoperative frozen section, we're not using. I'm not sure if they're using. They're not recommending. And solidification, you've heard about a lot, is to this, for the difficult organisms, the bar, what's about them? You actually use ultrasound to get better things. We're not using it here. And then we're using an island a lot, but it's not free. So what about preoperative? PG bacterium is the acne, so we can see is the problem. We used to think it in the axilla. It's not, it's actually in the sebaceous gland, so it's more in the chest and back, and it's more in young males than other groups. So you can decrease that burden of the disease by using 3% hydrogen peroxide and 5% benzoyl peroxide. It also treats the other bugs. The problem with it, nobody has shown that it changes your QT bacterial acne outcome at the moment. It does decrease your colonization, but it hasn't been shown to reduce infection. 
while on the chlorhexidine we show an overall over overall bacterial load, but rather without a significant decrease in acute bacterial acne. So if you're going to do shoulder arthroplasty, we should be using benzoyl peroxide and uh, hydrogen peroxide. I'm not sure if anybody can be using it. I'm not sure maybe the other can comment whether they're all using it. Too. And I couldn't get it in, in the, I did start asking for it, but they didn't have it. Okay, so options, options as we know from our, our own meeting here, one dose of antibiotics preoperatively is the only dose that you need to do, and you need to increase the dose if they're greater than 120. What's interesting for me in the shoulder, they show vancomycin is the alternative to allergic. Don't use pindamycin. If you use pindamycin, they, they have a four times increased risk of infection compared to the people who have um, vancomycin. If you use pindamycin compared to vancomycin. So we were giving pindamycin to treat the TT bacterium acne. Like we don't, you know, an allergic patient is given pancomycin. And you've got to change your anesthetism because they all, the clindamycin is drawn up when they're allergic to penicillin. You change it to pancomycin. There's a 28% reduction in PJRs and you receive povidone ID vancomycin powder protocol without medical complications or increase in pancomycin. For me, this is very important. I brought it up at our meeting before because if, you've been, if you're putting your graphs in vancomycin to so the ACL and the other people are putting their Tissue, they're soaking their implants in vancomycin. They say again, reducing their thing. I've been putting the vancomycin now and I've been using the Pavidone ID. And this study actually now validates it for me, but it hasn't been recommended by that ICM group. But I can tell you, this is what I've been trying to do now if I have a prolonged surgery or a, a joint replacement or revision. They all get let in always, but now I'm having better, if not a gentamycin. Um, so what about the surgery? So the day, unlike the others, is within six weeks, seems to be in the shoulder. It's not a three-week cutoff, it seems to be a six-week cutoff, and no poly exchange for some of them. They did this arthroscopic looking with a 70% success rate. So within six weeks, no poly exchange, because that's what I asked our bone infection unit. They couldn't give us an answer about the poly, so because it's much more difficult with the reverse rate. And, and anyway, so we haven't, we, I haven't always changed exchange of body, but you can do an arthroscopic or open, which is unusual for me because I, I thought it was just open. So that's what they looked at, up to six weeks. So 70% success rate, that's not bad. You think of the mobility of taking them up. The only advantage about doing a revision after three weeks or early is actually, it's easier to take the implants in. When they're well fixed, if you can't take that pain order, Took us half an hour to bang one of the multics uh, metric lens in. So um, there are these options in this. And this meta analysis in 2020 by AIM showed a pool reinfection rate of 7% in first stage revisions and 21% in two stage revisions. They also reported complications of 17% in one stage compared to 33% in two stage. And the patients who have undergo two stage, remember, they have a really debilitated period of time with a three or six months with a flail arm essentially, which is painful. But you must remember this analysis once again, like the bank cards and the letters, it's a selection bias. Who gets a one stage is people with the, you probably don't look infected, they have more treatable organisms, maybe younger. There's a whole bunch of reasons why it may actually not be quite true, but certainly in the shoulders, one stage may be better off for the patient with regards to more, for recurrence rates and probably more important than uh, complication and mobility. There are other options in, other, in uh, I think it's just for the uh, cement spacing, but they have four shoulder schools in the paper that's presented, 100% success, success rate for infection, but they had 18 complications in 60 patients with general erosion making it difficult for revisions or fractures on the other one. And then those frail patients who can't undergo, you can do chronic antibiotic suppression. I've seen basal, did it, I've seen a couple of basal patients long term that come through at seven or eight years of chronic suppression, intermittent draining signs, but they were functioning and, and were doing okay. So the antibiotics, there's no consensus. Six weeks, three months, six months, whatever it is. Basically, you've got to consult your infection disease Expert person, and you must choose the organ. You must treat the the patient with the antibiotic that will that will penetrate the tissues appropriately, 
and treat the bug at the same time with this, these complications of problem. I think if I look at the shoulder literature, it's probably three months up to six months, but there's no proof for any of this. And as we heard from um, Maritza and them, some people are even doing the two weeks. And I think it, the one guy, they just did one stage and gave him 24 hours of antibiotic. So it's a very low recurrence rate. So, but that's happened. Um, this paper from 2022 goes on to highlight these the problems and to say that this is from the literature and in fact our treatment options on uh, we haven't come up with any new ideas. But you go on to talk about the unexpected calcium, which, which is different to the other uh, joints. And this is you usually Karani bacteria. Um, okay, so uh, this is a problem for us because you biopsy the patient, not thinking they're infected when they come back. And they looked at 55 revision after party without signs of infection and compared to those who had two unexpected positive cultures and those who had not or one positive culture. All have been treated with antibiotics for three weeks and cultures were finalized. And if you had positive culture, you were treated for six months. And they report a 49% case, 49 percent of those patients with revisions who weren't thought to have sepsis at UPCs. Huh? With the males, as we said before, but there was no difference in functional outcome between those who, who were treated and not treated. So I'm not sure what the message is. Is it a normal commensal of a shoulder replacement revision, or is it a cause for concern? post -operative. so if you see a patient, if you give them an operation and it doesn't look septic, if you don't give them antibiotic for two weeks, it doesn't seem to be a problem if you have an indolent organism. So you are likely to have a, something that doesn't look septic. If you've got a staph aureus or something, it's going to look septic. But if you've got an indolent organism, there's no sense in putting them on three weeks of antibiotics just in case you've got an indolent because it doesn't seem to alter the outcome. And so that's a relief for me because that's the one thing I keep on to think, shit, this could be a Karani bacterium. It could be Karani bacterium. And in fact, I want to treat them for that. But don't put them through clindamycin and then they have a complete colitis. As we know, just from one dose and one patient got colitis, not half the scalp of the foot operation. But there's a foot surgeon. Okay, so outcome of first revision arthroplasty with focus on infection outcome of one and two stages. And this is published in 2003, and this confirms what we were saying from the previous study. One stage seems to be better than two stages with, with, with um, infection. Um, so the most common cases for uh, revisions were instability and infection, and then your infection rate went up after the revisions. That's what happens. I mean, and um, Theo from Theo from Victoria, the tumor surgeon Theo Daru, mm -hmm. they looked at the instability patients, and I think it was seventy percent. If you had a if you had a dislocation, you had a revision surgery, your sepsis rate was seventy percent. So you really want to avoid it. And if you're going to go to sepsis, you must use some of those things we talked about: banker mass and preoperative testing, all those other things. You must try and minimize everything you can do. There was a, okay, so there was a significant increased revision rate after two stage procedures for PGA now. Okay. One stage had a low rate of revision, of re revision. Okay. And most of the time, as we know, that if you're having a revision, it's almost always to a reverse. You don't go to, you can go to a hemi, but to, most people go to reverse rather than a hemi or, a, or another anatomic thing. Um, so they looked, at, they looked at the patient who had uh, two shoulder, two stage shoulder arthroplasty after deep infection from, from arthroplasty, osteoarthritis, or other operations. And they looked at the microbiology. And it was actually different. It was, it was mostly staph and less cutie bacterium. So if you have an infection from a previous operation, it's more likely to be staph from the cutie bacterium. And then more likely to be multi drug resistant and mixed microbiota. So if you're treating that patient, you must realize your antibiotic regime may need to change. When you're doing those patients, so it's a different patient, um, and the two stage actually worked well. We know, um, however, the high early post-operative rate, twenty five percent of you had a joint dislocation, um, and you had instability after that surgery. Sorry, and hematomas were common. Uh, so it's, um, 
Okay, so this paper actually is one. I, the reason I put this in, they they used the stage in plant and they got really good well, eighty nine percent. So if you look at the two stages, one one stage is about seventy percent. So is twenty percent? That's two out of ten patients are not going to have sepsis again. So for me, you've got to be very careful when you're deciding to do one stage or two stage. And I think those principles for the other hip and knee, you must know the organism. The post must be in good condition. You mustn't want to put bone graft. Unfortunately, very, very often you have to put bone graft or a reverse. So you must maybe thinking about putting a custom glenoid or an augmented glenoid rather than putting bone graft in them. Um, so th this is one or two that we've just seen in patient now, so I thought I might highlight this as well. This is somebody who had a spontaneous uh, shoulder infection. So no previous surgery or uh, problems, and they got 10 patients, and they um, they did a two-stage reverse shank, very good outcome, but they have complications. And we've seen that in ourselves. It's a, it's a, to get an infection in the shoulder is a disaster, and you can see the revision still had a problem, but they managed to get rid of the infection. So that, that's sort of unusual cases that we see, and we've just seen two this year. So more, more, more for Canada, because I'm sure they're going to see some negative infection as well. This one has been highlighted some of the, the paper published in May 2023 by preventing and treating infection. In fact, everything I've told you, they just repeated, but they did add this blue lights um, seem to reduce QT bacterium acne. So unlike our blue lights, it's harmless, and it may actually do some good by killing the QT bacteria. Um, so uh, they looked at the patient with single stage with implant retention and found a 50% failure rate. So if you look at the patients who are frail or well-fixed implants, you can tell them, listen, you can take your risk and have a 50%, you can actually and keep the implant in there. So it gives you a lot to think about. You would never do that with the hip or a knee. The other thing is your, your risk of complications was lower. So now you've got to discuss that with the patient. If you have a two-stage revision, your complications are much higher. Can you see that? So sometimes you've got to discuss it with the patient, the complications and the outcome, and let them make some of the decisions. And essentially, it's really for the older patients who don't want aggressive surgery. And finally, I, I just want to, we know that the morbidity and mortality, mortality is, is much worse. And the cost, I think it's three times for revision, it's three times the, the cost of that normal shoulder replacement. So we know there's a cost and morbidity associated with it, but there's definitely also morbidity, uh, mortality. Yeah. And you can look in the septic group, 20% compared to the aseptic group, and the time to death, at, um, and those undergoing revision in two years was seven versus two, and at five years, 73. So there's definitely a difference. You're not only making your, the tough life for your patients, but they die. And this was, didn't matter on your body mass index, race, sex, age, were not significantly different between the groups. Okay? The only difference was the utilization of two stage procedure, and you're more likely to die if you had a two stage procedure. Okay. So that's why I wanted to highlight that. Too. Finally, everybody's going about tailor made. I mean, when I challenge, they made a whole new thing in 3D modeling and printing. Makes no difference whether you make your own with your hand and the thing. No difference in outcomes, no difference in sepsis rate, no difference in complication. So I'm not sure we need tailored, modular, expensive. They're expensive. They're much more expensive than just making your own cement board. What do you think, Kevin? Just make your own. You're making your own. So their own handmade or 3D model. Okay. And then one last thing, because we've been looking at this. Surprisingly, you know, everybody's using CT and robotic surgery and stuff. There's a whole whole article, a whole journal on it. You can look at the international article, it's just been published. It's all on robotics, uh, augmented reality, virtual surgery, all of this sort of things that we're using with CT scans and patent specific instruments. They looked at uh, 8,000 implants and patients. You had a higher sepsis rate and DVT rate. Yeah. 
and no increase in general reasoning. So what they're telling you, by using them, there doesn't seem to be an improvement in what you're trying to prevent, which is general reasoning, but you have a high rate of sepsis and DVT. So that group mainly must use provodone and iodine, vancomycin, don't give them. This group, you must give DVT, but you're going to DVT prophylaxis, but now you're going to increase that. Things so basically, it's taking the surgery take longer, and you don't prove their clinical reason. That's it. So, just some snapshots of some recent articles on sepsis. Any questions? You said anemia is that with the blood transfusion or just anemia? Uh, blood transfusion, definitely. Yes, yes but we had a whole talk from the, the, uh, uh, the hematologist, and they need to do that. Once you're anemic. All your risk back, all nearly all your risk back, including sepsis. Regardless of if you get but I didn't back. find something specific on sepsis, but I, you did see something on sepsis. Okay, no questions. So I just want to thank Sham and Leon and Cam. Thank you very much for coming and sharing uh, a lot of work and insight into some of the shoulder problems. I'm sure you learned a lot. And uh, you will write a memory on Monday. I'm going to be asking questions on Monday. You will have to write Okay. Okay. Thanks again, Jan, Cameron, and everybody else for joining. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I think you were so I <laughs> 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 